Hello and welcome to the Goddess Project Podcast Side Series Goddess Talks. I'm so very excited to share the side series with you, which are just going to be a few episodes um, that are embedded through the other episodes, the regular episodes of the Goddess Project. And the Goddess Talks will be interviews with other scholars, with other people that are in the field of goddess worship of the divine feminine people that i really want to talk uh, to about the goddess so this series is a little bit selfish and in the sense that it is something that i enjoy doing and that i love doing and so i'm very very excited to share it with you guys and i'm very excited to have these conversations and you know widen the circle and of scholars and widen the knowledge that can be shared. Often a lot of scholars that are doing really fantastic work are not on social media or haven't really developed like a YouTube site or other sites. And then sometimes they have fantastic social media. And so I really would like to share with everyone some of the people that inspire me and some of the writers that I find intriguing and also that I find their research super intriguing. So welcome to the Goddess Talks series. I hope that you enjoyed the series as much as I enjoy recording it. Hello all and welcome to another episode of Goddess Talks. This week I had the pleasure to talk to Ruth Barrett. We had a fantastic conversation about Dianic Wicca and about her life experience within Wicca and within the community of women and women's mysteries. Ruth is an ordained Dianic High Priestess, a seasoned ritualist, a teacher and author dedicated to the propagation of women's magic and mysteries. Her critically acclaimed Women's Rights, Women's Mysteries, Intuitive Ritual Creation book is in its third edition, and it was republished in 2018. Ruth has also contributed to several anthologies, everything from the writings of priestesses to the foremothers of women's spirituality movement, also um, lots of works on gender politics, and of course, an early Uh, entry into ritual to women in world religions, faith, and culture across history. She has taught at ritual arts, sorry, she has taught ritual arts at festivals and conferences across the United States, in Canada, Great Britain, since the 1980s. In 1997, she was honored as a recipient of the Lace Award for Outstanding Contributions in the Area of Spirituality from the Gay and Lesbian Center in Los Angeles. She's co-founded the Temple of Diana, Inc., Diana Inc. and National uh, Dianic Temple with groves in California, in Michigan, and also Wales. Since 2020, Ruth teaches classes online through the Guardians of the Grove, Temple of Diana Inc., and her passion is teaching skills to create personal and group rituals, spellcraft, as well as community building. I have the honor of joining Ruth for a gathering in October, at the end of October in California, and I will post more details about this gathering underneath. Um, it was really wonderful to talk to Ruth and to learn more about the Dianic Temple, and I'm very, very excited for you guys uh, to hear our conversations. Thank you so much for tuning in or for watching us on YouTube. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, share, all the things that allow my channel to continue working so that we can interview more women in the future and keep the sacred feminine, the divine feminine, the her history developing and growing in our communities. Okay, so hello, Ruth, uh, and welcome to the Goddess Talks uh, part of the Goddess Project. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very, very excited for us to talk about your work and your history and your life experiences, Mm -hmm. um, especially around uh, Diana, the Dianic Temple and Diana. So how are you? (laughs) I'm thrilled to be here, and you happen to be... um... Uh, recording this conversation the day before I actually go to Crete I go to Crete in the morning so it's kind of it there's I'm kind of vibrating with the with where I what I know is hap is going to come tomorrow right is this your first time I know you've mentioned it to me before that you've been before right I have been this is going to be my 10th time time oh yeah this is going to be my 10th time and um I I been co-leading this journey with a wonderful woman named Catherine and she had this is her 13th trip 
Ooh. And uh, she then invited me to co-lead this pilgrimage, this goddess pilgrimage to Crete. And first it was like, I never even thought about going to Crete. Why would I go to Crete? <laughs> and then she right. says, she trusts me, trust me, <laughs> just come this one time. Right. 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 Yeah. So, okay. So this is totally off topic from what I was going to ask, you, but how, <laughs> how was that? Like, okay. Because when I went to Crete for the first time, there was a visceral reaction in my body. Yes. yes. Did you experience that? Yes. As well? Okay. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is what women experience when they go. It is, it is the, I think it's because, and I don't, I could cry right now. I, I think it's because we're not, we are so unaccustomed to feeling the goddess in the land, in the people, in the food, in the art, in the caves, in the fill in the blank. I mean, she, it's not that you have to dig her out. She's, yeah. she's there. And the response to that fit on a physical level with the way that the, 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 the breezes caress you, the water receives you and holds you the way that, I mean, it's really a, a sensory, it's a sensory experience that is incredibly healing. Yes. And it is also the first place that I ever went and others, of course, where the art is unapologetically female centered. I mean, oh. Okay. You know, the, it's like the Minoan, you know, the imagery and, and of nature and, and goddesses and, you know, or the priestesses. I know it's sort of debatable with what they are exactly. And that doesn't even matter. Right. What matters, what matters is that the response to seeing her in that sacred way is profound and transformational. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I had a conversation with someone yesterday and I was telling them about Crete. And one of the things that I said is how it vibrates for me. Like the earth vibrates yes, for me. Yes. When you put your feet on the ground, you feel a surge of something. I start writing poetry when I'm yes. there. I start yes. planning. I have these, you know, wild visions for the right. And, yes. And I and so and then when I come back, you're absolutely right. I live in Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. So the land is so devoid of I don't know of this energy. So you do have to look for it much harder. Like when yeah. I'm home, even yes. meditating is a lot harder, right? You have to kind of focus more. We're just sitting on the ground in Crete or like you're right, the water everywhere. It's magical. It's fantastic. I love that, that you also had that experience because I thought maybe it's just me, you know? No, it is. It is absolutely not only you. It is everyone that has gone there. It is a, it is profound. And the first time I went into the Heraklion Museum, the archaeological museum in Heraklion, I, I was so overwhelmed. I literally had to leave and then return. I had, I was hyperventilating <laughs> because and it's a, it's about what you said the the imagery on the pottery you know the the whether it was the sea creatures or the you know whatever the they were moving it it's like they knew something about the vibration of life because other it's like the 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 energy from the the artist to the pot to the uh what they used to do the painting you know it's still alive. Yeah. And I know, you know, that may sound really crazy to some folks, but I have to tell you it that you we're so used to walking into museums where things are dead. Yes. Okay. So I walk into this place and I'm like, boom, and I'm watch. I'm it's like I wasn't on drugs, <laughs> you know, but you <laughs> had that feeling like, you know, like the fish are still swimming on the pottery okay there's not like there's nothing that's dead going on here so that was amazing absolutely unique experience you know it's funny you say that because you know there's that room where there's the priestesses or goddesses whatever where they're all yeah. holding their hands up and that whole wall is full of them yes. and when i walked in i almost started crying yes like yes it was so powerful and there was another woman there kind of filming and i just stood i'd never seen anything like that all the way they are all together on yes. that wall 
Yes. And I was in tears and she looks at me, she goes, this is really powerful. Right. And I thought, yes. yeah, like, that's right. I'm just so emotionally like moved. And I've been to many museums as I'm sure you have as well. And very rarely am I moved by a, mm-hmm. a wall full of, you know, yes. artifacts. And it, you're, that's so right. that's a really good explanation that the energy of that is still in the they, pottery. They knew, I, it's almost like, I mean, I, that they knew how to transmute it into yeah. into it where it continues to have an aliveness that is then received by the viewer thousands of years later. I mean, wow. Right? Right. Like, yes. You know, just digesting that is. Yes. And then I had this other realization with the art, you know, there, there had, there was actually like a wall that had a lot of these kind of spiral images, but it was three dimensional. They were as though it was a sculpture coming out, like Mm -hmm. almost like a breast, you know, kind of coming out. And, and it was at that moment, I also realized something about the symbols, because when you, when you look at a symbol, like I'm, I'll look, you know, let's just even look at this, this yes. spiral, which was made by a, an amazing artist on Crete that I buy everything that he can make. I love, I love. <laughs> um, yeah, he's in, he's in the southern part of the island. Anyway, um, but I realized that when you see an image that is fixed, which often you'll see, oh, well, there's a spiral or there's a whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not, sub- it, it's a moment in time that is fixed but it's not supposed to be experienced that way. It's supposed to be experienced as something constantly in motion. So the spiral, the spiral is moving, never stops moving, but this is like if you took a picture of a bird in flight and then you showed, you know, an outstretched wings of a bird and you showed it to someone and said, oh, that's a bird. And they would go, okay that's a bird but you've only captured a momentary it's a continuation of what was and what then is the next motion and it's and but we experience it as something static and it's not yeah i never thought of it that way and and i'm excited to go back and look at it from from this perspective I did see it as very unique. And even like there's that, there's that famous bowl with the octopus on it. And it you just you're just drawn into it. You're just like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're just like, um, yeah. but I never thought about the fact that that they purposely would have put this energy into the pieces and that echoes thousands of years later. That's beautiful. And I don't, I can't speak to whether they they it, you know, that it was a magical act that they were transmuting it. I can't, that right. that it had, it carried that intention with it, mm-hmm. but it, whatever they did is still vibrating. I don't, you know, so. I'm so excited for you. I think you. So excited for <laughs> yeah. you. I thank uh, you. A little jealous, but super excited for you. I, super excited for you. I'll, I'll take you with me in spirit. I thank and, you. and there's and there's a woman. Um, there's a woman who's bringing your book with her to on the trip. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yes. Yeah. And that's the only reason I'm not bringing my copy because I know there's one coming <laughs> on the trip. I'm very very excited. Very excited. Okay. So then let me ask you some other yes. questions that I have. So I have a, a, a unusual a usual introduction one, which is um, when did you first feel called to the goddess? Uh, you know, so when did your journey begin? And if you want to tell us a little bit like how. Sure. Yeah. Yes. So my journey began when I was a child um, and I where I my affinity with nature was where I I experienced this thing called God because that was the language, you know, of what I was raised with. But I was also raised with that the word God could mean anything. It was not actually designated to a particular form. Right. You know, and and I was told that by my parents. So it was God could be whatever you say God is kind of thing. It was left very open. So that was helpful because uh, God has started speaking to me when I was in my as a preteen and I started writing poetry naming her specifically when I I remember starting about 12 years old and um I had read a lot of mythology earlier I was like you know ravenous for mythology 
at the time, of course, I didn't think about the fact that it was all patriarchal, you know, uh, mythology, right. you know, because that's all you had, you know, the bullfinches mythology, blah, blah, blah. That's right. But, um, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, and so, but basically, I um, really had, I had a lot of what I would call spiritual experiences. I think I basically thought about it that I had created my own religion. Mm. Because I wasn't fine, you know, this is before this is we're talking, um, you know, 19 late 1960s, you know, or middle 1960s. I mean, you're talking I'm I'm turning 70 next year. Right. Uh-huh. So I've been I've, I've been with this for a while. Nice. So it it, um, you know, the the at being able to be a part of and experience the beginnings of what became the goddess movement or the goddess spirituality movement within the larger context of women's spirituality, which began again, early 1970s into the 1980s, etc. Um, I got to have really a firsthand um, seat and participation in that process, which isn't, I happen to be in the right place at the right time. I mean, wow. right. Wow. So, um, and that was um, growing up in Los Angeles at that time. And a lot of a lot of women who became, were also foremothers of what we call the women's spirituality movement uh, were there also. Um, and so I got to experience and participate and we were really like, you know, the, it, there's this expression, an idea whose time has come or an mm-hmm. idea whose time has come again. Um, and there's I always think about that movie it's an old movie okay so you may not have seen it but it was called Close Encounters of the Third Kind it was yes, absolutely. You know, about, about the, you know the spaceships coming down that's but right it, but what what was amazing what what is similar the point I'm trying to make is that people started drawing or sculpting this image of this mountain in the movie you know and didn't understand why they were doing it and didn't know why but they knew it was important and it meant something so here women were starting to write poetry and create dance and create, you know, music and art and do like start digging for this thing. They didn't even know what they were, but it's like, we're just going with this. And that was this amazing time of just intense creativity where it's like goddess was saying, hello, Right. Time, time to come back. And, um, and this, these are all like bunches of ways that I'm coming back. So find your, find your place and dig me out. Wow. You know? Wow. So, so grateful for that. Um, so grateful that that took right. place and that, yes. that it felt right. Like, and what I mean that it wasn't shut down immediately, that it didn't sort of, you yes. know, it wasn't, uh, because that's really been the, the foundation for yes. well, it is the foundation of everything we're doing today. Um, exactly. Today, I can't tell. I mean, you you'd have to tell me since you were there, sort of. But I, I can't tell if today it's burgeoning again or um, it has shifted in some way. I'm well, finding it everywhere. Everyone, yeah. yes, the language of the goddess. Yes, I think that. Well, first of all, the work of, of Maria Gambutas you know, who is so foundational to the, the archaeology and the folklore mythology, folk, folk, folklore and mythology of all of this. I mean, she was also in Los Angeles at that time, and I, she was a neighbor. So, I mean, I knew her from there, right? Wow. So, so, you know, she, um, you know, she dug the goddess out of the yeah. ground and yeah. she dared and she dared to interpret what she found. And she, of course, you must know as a scholar, you know, she was vilified for so long and now she has been vindicated because of DNA and because of things that were, you know, I don't I can't explain the whole thing because I, I don't I won't remember it perfectly. But basically it is she's now acknowledged as having been right on about her and about her what she was talking about even for me when i was doing my phd uh and i used uh, i think i was allowed to use one of her books but not Mm -hmm. all of her books Mm -hmm. and the interesting thing was that the the academics on my committee a couple of them were women 
And they were very, very caught. And, and not just her, but Merlin Stone's work. Yeah. Uh, I think I snuck in maybe Cynthia Eller's work. I could sneak in a couple of things. Yeah. But my very first, you know, when you pr when you present your books that you're going to do for your comp exams and things like yeah. that, I had a lot of these um, pioneering women on there. And just they just cut, 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 cut. And it was, we yeah. don't want to hear about goddess worship. And we don't want to hear about this. And it was, but myself, when I started reading, it felt really like this is the right path. Um, yeah. So it's, I'm really, I'm really glad to see that people are supporting Maria Gimbutas more and more and that she's yeah. become more and more vindicated. I hope, I hope it'll go into sort of the academic fields as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just saying to a friend recently, because I'm, I'm translating something from back home that's based on silver and gold artifacts. But one of the things that they're doing now is they are just like just stating a label like so just saying um figurine maybe they might say the word female this mm -hmm. year and where it's found so they are really right. not they're moving away from trying to interpret the idea of goddess or priestess i'm surprised they say female especially if there's breasts or some kind of you know what is going on right like yeah it's... what's going on is a denial of the body mm. Mm -hmm. and um it's really creeped into academia uh, i've been hearing starting to hear a lot about this and it's very disturbing yeah. um you know like erase body and of course if you erase body you erase her yes, yes. so it but there's this the uh the i think that gender ideology has really come into the field yeah. and unfortunately um it's really colored in a negative way in my in my view um it, and is trying to kind of erase what we've brought forward yeah yeah there seems to be a, a pushback and i get that to some degree but there seemed to be a pushback against the mothering and the nurturing exactly right exactly um, yes right? there's a sort of movement against like when i went to uh, when I got into my PhD program, one of the things one of my mentor was saying is just don't say anything about having kids, you know, don't say anything about, and I would sit in meetings <laughs> where people would call people with kids breeders. Okay. You know? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. I was like, you know what, you, you know what you're dealing with then. Okay. Yeah. That is, you know, and that's misogyny. Let's just name it at the top. It's misogyny. It's it's woman hating. Um, it and it's and it and when women take it on, yes. because because uh, they think they have to to get be successful in that in that particular world, it is um, internalized misogyny and it's erasing themselves. Yeah. And that you know I have no problem stating my view on that because it's so clear to me. Yeah. And I don't think they would deny it. Uh, well, I don't know if they say misogyny, but I think that they would, I don't think that they would disagree with the fact that they see themselves as other than mothering or other than mm -hmm. nurturing. They see themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and so I thought that now to be fair, now I, I have a few students who are uh, in mm -hmm. graduate school and stuff and they do have families or whatever, and it's not as taboo, but, and that's, I think, because the online world has allowed for this idea that you could do stuff online from home, mm -hmm. but it was really um, shocking. It was really shocking. It was really mm -hmm. interesting to me. And so that actually brings me to what I'm doing now. And mm -hmm. that sort of makes me uh, to questions about the Diana temple, because now yeah. as I'm moving away, I'm not moving away from academia. I mean, I'm still teaching at university, mm -hmm. but I've published this book myself because I didn't want mm -hmm. the publicist to tell me what to put in and what to take out. Hey. Right. The other right. thing I found was um, publishing houses, especially academic ones. They want your book to fit with whatever yes. they're doing. Sure. And my book doesn't fit in any of their, you know, um, and their idea is, well, it's just, there's no interest in this in classics. I'm like, well, but there's interest in this among women. Right. And I don't know. That's half the world's population. Yeah. <laughs> it's important. <you> know? <laughs> right. Um, so I found it very difficult where people would be like, well, see where it fits in our stuff. And I looked at their stuff and I'm like, okay. No, no. Right. It, it, this is where, I mean, I, I mean, I, I do what I need to do. I don't, I try not to be influenced by like, this is a, this is a message that needs to be out. Mm -hmm. This is information that needs to be out there. If you don't get it, that's too bad on you. It's still going out. 
Exactly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it my way. It'll be yes. a lot more work for me to promote myself and stuff. But then when I did do that and I started working on my Instagram and social media from that mm-hmm. perspective, mm-hmm. there were mm-hmm. so many women yes. that came right. at me. Like there was so much love and response. Yes. And I thought, oh uh-huh. my God, I thought I was yes. alone. So you, right. you, you know, now you're not, <laughs> you know, you're not, <laughs> and you know, that, that, um, you know, there's a thing about being a pioneer in a in a field to bring forward information that is not popular mm. or assumed to be whatever, I, I, you know, in fitting right. in. But what's always been true in my experience is that there are thousands of women who are hungry for exactly what you um, what you are doing. And 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 the same for me, it's like you're still holding you're you're holding the information so that and making a point making it possible for women to find you yeah and that and that's it it's like i gave up trying to make it work with other people's visions for you know a long time ago because i just i had to hold myself back and i no yeah 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 which brings me so i started the, the artemis center online and it's sort of just mm-hmm. just birthed Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I saw your Dianic temple, and Mm -hmm. so I thought, oh, wow. And I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to do some more research on that. And I'll put Mm -hmm. all the links underneath Mm -hmm. this video so that people can look that up as well. Um, Mm -hmm. so how did you, how did that process, like, how did you find the temple and decide you want to be a part? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I'm actually a, um, a co-founder. So, um, again, it needs to happen. So I'm going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) so um you know the the dianic tradition was revived was i'm going to use the word revived because um z budapest who was the is acknowledged as sort of the the grandmother of the tradition of reviving a female-centered women-only ritual tradition mm-hmm. based in women's mysteries which are the rites of passage of the female body mm-hmm. and also how the culture of patriarchy that we live in influences how we view ourselves Mm -hmm. what we can and cannot do what we where we think we can go or not go the you know we all live in a context right we we live in this fishbowl and based on the culture you live in we're influenced by that we can't help it you know so we can either go along with it or we can find ourselves uncomfortable with it and want to change it or escape (laughs) or you know and help others get out (laughs) so so um this was this this was what was um happening also in los angeles in 1971 um is when it it this officially began with a winter solstice ritual that that z budapest facilitated in in southern california in west hollywood and um and then I got in, I was already involved with a woman named Shakina Mountainwater, who is also a foremother. Um, she's passed away now. And um, I had began sort of formally studying with her in the mid 1970s, but I had n- met her in like 1971, 72, um, because I'm a musician also. So I have my interest, it has always been in folklore and. Um, traditional ballads, especially that's where I got my start. And where is the magic that is embedded in these stories in these sung, you know, themes. And so I began, you know, when I was in school and went to college, I began to, I created an independent major for myself in folklore. And my font, like my senior thesis, whatever was introduction to the great mother. (laughs) So I, (laughs) I, I got to, you know, I got to, uh, to take what I was researching. And again, this was really early on and there was not, um, there was really not a lot of resources that, that other than say the Jungian stuff, the, um, you know, Eric Newman, the great mother, there was, you know, Robert Graves, the white goddess, there was Esther Harding's book, um, women's mysteries, but it was again, from more of a, a psychological perspective, you know, Yeah. but, um, so, but, you know, you go with what you're able to access. So that's why, again, a book like yours 
is extremely important because it gives another opening for you know more information so um basically i didn't i got involved in in the mid to later 1970s i got involved with the uh, susan b anthony coven number one in los angeles which um was z's group and then she moved away in 1979 and ordained me to re to continue the her work in los angeles at the ripe age of 25 years old oh my god wow yeah i was a young i, I and i was a young mother i mean i had a little baby my daughter you know it's like I was married to a man. I mean, you know, it was really an interesting time. I but, feel all of those things. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, and so, but I knew some things because I, I knew, I knew, um, I was open to whatever this adventure was because I was terrified, of course. How are you supposed to step into this kind of a position? But I had had some really excellent modeling from my family um, around re not only religious leadership, I was raised in the uh, in one of the founding families of Reconstructionist Judaism. Wow. So I had a, a really, really rich background um, with ritual, home ritual, uh, communal ritual. And um, so I was set up as a ritualist really early on, but the the metaphors of she was missing <laughs> right you know and all of that and so i i really transitioned to that very easily because that was my sensibility about if we're going to use a metaphor to create about the creator it's got to be female of course right. i mean any you know you don't have to have a belief about that you can see it happening every day mm -hmm. 100%. <laughs> all right no yeah. brainer so um anyway um so i then began to what was true for me is that I, un, for me, it felt really important to create a way to pass on information. To pa how do you pass on, um, if something is just spirituality, I feel like that's a personal thing. Okay. But if you're gonna come together with others to do something together, whether it's celebrating the seasonal cycle, whether it's uh, rites of passage about, you know, any of the things we go through in our culture, um, having some things in common and some basic understanding of vocabulary you know words have to mean something <laughs> um so i set about to do that because otherwise to me it was like how do you pass on something that's just personal right good question right yes, absolutely right so i i then began to um create a a full you know thing of classes i you know i put the students who came to classes uh, in, in, in service to the larger community, providing public rituals, you know, all of this, you know, it just, you know, if, if we're going to do this, we have to really do this, you know? Right. Yeah. So, um, like right now that my community, that is a continuation from 1971 in Los Angeles is still going. Wow. wow. Yeah. And you said that there's, this is a national temple. That it, it, yes. And exactly but you know we're linked to that beginning of um uh and so like i now just teach online except in, unless i which during the pandemic of course everything you know went that way and i never thought i would be doing that ever um and <laughs> found myself you know doing it and finding what can i teach online well some things i can teach online but other things not so much right. you know and so finding out, you know, what I could do and what I can and and we there's amazing women who are teaching through Temple of Diana and, um, you know, I'm a t I'm one of the teachers um, and my wife is an incredible teacher and others there's you know there's others and so we have a gathering in the fall, you know, called Daughters of Diana gathering and it's always over Halloween weekend like it's a four day event. Okay. Um, and so I'll make sure you can put up a link about that. I yes, haven't, please. it hasn't started. It's small, you know, it's small, but it's wonderful. Yeah. And um, we close out the old year and we, op we open to the new year together and we, we learn from each other. It's really 
quite wonderful. So, you know, um, it's, I mean, a lot of things have changed. Um, I think what you talked about, you know, the idea of things have expanded, you know, like, I, I think that's absolutely true as it, as it would. Um, sometimes though, it's amazing. I find so many, I find women who really have had no idea this was all here for them. Yes. You yes. know, yes. and, yes. um, and that's an extraordinary thing. It used to be that before the bookstores, women's bookstores, especially started closing that, um, cause we had bookstores that were, those are community centers. That's where you could go and, you know, find these books and find, you know, feminist theory and find, you know, women's spirituality and novels and art and, you know, various things. And now not happening. Yeah. you not know, happening. When you say that, I have this sort of vision of having a, a, a library with a little, you know, cafe store of women's yes. work. Yes. Um, perhaps it's time to revision that in some way. Uh, I love it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and even for myself, I, as a person who sort of came out of that cloth, like came out and now I'm, I'm stumbling upon all of this active burgeoning, um, even for myself, I feel a little bit like, how did I not know that this was going on? I don't know if it's an Ontario thing and a Canada, like the, the, the province that I'm in, there isn't very much goddess anything mm -hmm. uh it's, it has a different mood and a different tone mm -hmm. so sometimes mm -hmm. i wonder if being in different geographical places in the world i think that's that that definitely is is a factor but you'd be surprised yeah you know we're also everywhere it's yeah. kind of like this amazing thing it's like i mean i'm now working with students from you know all different parts of the world which and they think they're all alone yeah you know yeah. So, you know, it it's it's wonderful to be able to offer a place like you're doing with your podcast, for example, or your, you know, when you lecture and then, you know, women can come in and they can these online communities are surprisingly satisfying even though I wouldn't have thought it would be. Agreed. Yes. I think so too. I think in part so I joined I had joined like a a temple with some friends. And they were like, you know, come from, come for Beltane or come for Solstice yeah. or whatever. And I thought, okay, whatever, it's online. And then they do a meditation. And there's been a couple of times where I, by myself in my room, obviously everyone else is on Zoom, mm -hmm. going through this meditation, have felt such a powerful meditation, such a powerful moment where I would like be brought to tears, which I was glad that no one was seeing me. Sure. Um, so you're absolutely right. Like, I think. I also underestimated the power of doing a communal yes. experience through Zoom. I mean, yes, yeah. live is, of course, very different, but sometimes people cannot afford to come to a place, right? Exactly. Women exactly. or women don't have access. You know, we've been offering these online seasonal rituals now for the for the last three years, mm. um, you know, group of facilitators, you know, putting, we'll have summer solstice coming up, you know, in a few weeks. And it, it's like, it's, a, it becomes a, 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 a circle through the computer <laughs> somehow. Yes. Yes. You know? yes. And, you know, I think about it, even myself, like for women who maybe are not ready to come out mm -hmm. as a goddess worshiper, they might be doing this in their closet right? Or whatever, exactly. you know, in a private space yes. with yes. headphones on, yes. but still being a part. Yes. You're right. You're right. It's right. a, it's, it becomes a safe space. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm all for it for that. And, and you, and being together in the flesh is obviously a, a different experience, but if you can't have that for all these reasons, I'm deeply grateful for this, you know, technology. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, let me scroll through my questions. Sure. What are the questions? Um, oh, oh, I have a question. Well, I have a bunch. Um, do you consider what's going on goddess revival? You use the word revival or reconstruction? Um, I, well, when I talked about the Dianic tradition, I said, like Z Budapest would say, she didn't create this women only. Women have always gathered. 
Mm, yes. to attend to ourselves okay yes. this is this is as ancient as it gets yes okay so when she says um she considers that she revived it it just means within second wave feminism she kind of brought this you know this piece of of spirituality slash religion you know piece she got it going because feminists at the at that time especially in the in the 1970s were not interested in in religion or spirituality it was very in the United States. Uh, uh, feminism was very informed by Marxist politics, where the idea that you know, religion is the opium of the people, yes. you know, it's like it's a distraction from the work. We're trying to get the ERA passed. We're trying to get reproductive rights. We're trying to get equal pay for equal work. Why are you talking about this thing? It seemed like this other thing, not in and of course, feminist spirituality, which is um, what we're talking about, combines an, the understanding of how religion and spirituality is, is and always has been political. Yes. Because, because it influences how you are in the world, your values, your, your view, your paradigm, your, you know, how do you understand about what's going on? You know, what is the context? So, um that is a big part of our tradition in particular where we are we we come from the values of i guess what would be called radical feminism now because at the time it was just feminism but now a lot of third wave feminism is more about men's rights in my opinion than than it is about women so you know it's um but the idea of when women come together and have our our safe space and uh, apart from males truth is told yes yes you're absolutely you know and i'm going through a bit of a phase of my life now where um i feel the need to be surrounded solely by women mm -hmm. um however they present as women is yes. totally fine with me as long sure. as it's sort of a, a away from not even toxic masculinity because i didn't you know you stay away from that as much as you can but mm -hmm. just masculine and a part of me you know, I have a son mm -hmm. you know I had a husband right you know for 25 years mm -hmm. I have a dad a brother I have nephews mm -hmm. actually I have a lot of men in my life sure. um, but it's so it's not you know the way the sort of they frame it in this way of like women uh, men male bashing or anything but it's it is about space like yes and it's about an energy and a vibe and mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how many women are being called to that, but aren't comfortable phrasing it, um, you know, right? Oh, aren't yeah. Phrasing it that way, yes. um, but feel the need to be around other, you know, yes. that feminine, that divine femininity yes. is, that is not just like birthing, which is fine, mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, but mm -hmm. it is also powerful and fierce yes. and sometimes right. like rage mm -hmm anger and yes. so yeah right like yes yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i tend to not use for me i don't i tend i don't tend to use gendered words like feminine or masculine because someone made up what those words mean and it wasn't us <laughs> true. Very okay true. so i tend to uh, avoid those words because I, I think that every human, female or male, are are um, able to experience the full breadth of experiences as a human, okay? And when we put, box ourselves into human characteristics that are assigned to a particular body, mm -hmm. I think that that does an incredible disservice, and all, uh, it's limiting, and I think it ultimately is oppressive to everyone. Yes. So, so, you know what what people tend to think is that oh if i'm in a women's group all we're going to do is male bashing it's like it never happens right I, I i have yet to experience that and i've been at this again a while because but again that that's a male-centered yes that's a male-centered view that if women are alone of course we're going to be doing that well the world isn't centering around that's right about around him we're talking about us right now <laughs> that's right that's right, right. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's that's a male fear, a man's fear. It's like, yeah. what are they doing when they're all alone? And of course, yeah. in the past, that has had very violent consequences. Yes, of course. Um, but even now, it's sort of, um, there's almost like a guilt around it. Like, oh, you know, you don't want to have, you don't like men, you know? And uh, it's such a trap. It's a trap and it's a lie. So, right, you know, but, right. but, it, but it works. It does work. Right. Uh, and makes women afraid to yes. um, to be honest. It's like you know, I just need I want to be with the with the women right now. I need to talk about the things that have to do with my life. Yes, yes. And so there. Yeah. So so here's to more of those spaces because yes. as we're having these conversations, I'm finding that a lot of other women are having similar conversations, and perhaps this is why everyone is or, or they're trying to congregate in spaces. Yes, where they can yes. experience that, you know. So, so the thing I just want to mention about, uh, at least you know, in this country, uh, in the U.S., the because you know, organ religious organizations or churches. I don't like using that word personally. I use temple, right? right. But um, that is a way, a legal way to have um, female, what I call female sovereign space. Okay. This is so. This is where no matter if the states are an individual state is saying you cannot, you know, discriminate against um, someone who either declares themselves to be a woman in their male body, you know, male bodied person uh, under religion. Really, you are protected mm. because um, no one is going to come in and say, "Well, you have to change your religion." It just Right. So I think um, there are more and more women who are looking to create that model. Yes. So and I would support, you know, the woman you mentioned earlier who's talk, thinking about that. Yes. And I've been I do a lot of talking about this with groups and with individuals, because this right now is maybe the only way for now to yes. make sure that you can gather with with women and girls and um have that legally protected your right to yeah. do that you're absolutely right about that because we i also struggle with the word church uh although this is her project so i'm assisting mm -hmm. vice presidenting or whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be called um and so i'm you know you have to go with what you're called i have my you know well state. but it's 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 a legal term the reason i'm just saying call it whatever you want i see it, illegally like Okay, yes. but you don't have to call it that in your within your organization. I got it right. So there's okay. a the language is protective under the clause. Under, clause. Uh, yes, that's it. Yeah, that's yes. amazing. And I think this is the one of the reasons that she's called to it is that she wants a brick and mortar space in which women can meet safely. Right. Yes. yes. Right. right. Um, and so uh, I love real estate. I'm, I love real estate. So I'm like, I will find us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'm looking around at all these things. Mm -hmm. And and America has, I learned that America has a whole site for churches that are sold, a whole like separate realtor.com site, whatever. And I was all excited. And in Canada, we don't we don't have stuff like that. So so yeah, so let's see how it goes. But I find it fascinating because I know that you've been in this Dianic temple for so long, and yet um it continues to grow, which is really encouraging because it just shows me that the movement is not, you know, marginalized or is not. Yes. In fact, it's becoming maybe more centered. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it could right? be. I yeah. And how many women? If you know how many women have come to me that are going to Crete uh, lately, you know, I mean, I remember the days of Carol Christ, right, was ostracized in academia for moving to create she used to be a warning story when I was an undergrad that's terrible. Um, it was the idea was like don't go too far out in the goddess worship you'll end up sort of like Carol Christ which I loved like I loved her work <laughs> I loved the way she was living um I wish I would have had you know still a student I wish I had the money to join her on that yeah. pilgrimage yeah. But I, once I did have the money, I took that pilgrimage. I mean, she was already sick by then. Um, and I just did it myself. And it was, you know, just still amazing. Yeah. Um, but and so now when I think of her, I think of her as a mentor, right, as a pioneer. And I think about all the backlash she had. Yes. Then I see all these women that are going to Crete uh, on different yes. pilgrimages. And I think the island is calling us. 
but I yes. think it's like yes. a, a greedy divinity that is like come yes. come come yes. that's right? right you know and I think you know similar to what we talked about with Maria Gambutas it's like when you see academia you know cautioning you don't go there don't go to toward this person or that person as a person who wants to get their degree and wants to do the study that's terrible because you know you're you're basically then having to not go with your own instincts oh yeah right and so and and by saying you know don't don't go there um i just that to me is just ethically really wrong <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I was at this goddess conference as well. And I met a few of the scholars who were asking me, well, when you got your PhD, what was your methodology? Which I can barely remember what it was because mm -hmm. I had to fit all yes. of my stuff in I some yes. structure yes. just to be allowed to yes. research. And now when she was asking me, I was like, I don't know. I made up some yeah. stuff and put it together yeah. because, you know, right. I mean, it's not made up, it's real, but yeah. Uh, and she was saying the same. She goes, well, I have these ideas about the goddess in, in her own culture. Yeah. And she's like, and I have to come up with a methodology and I can't really find one. And I don't know. And I thought, wow, you know, we've really, I don't know. It, it, yeah. It has to, you know, academia has to, has to open up a bit. There has to be. It's, un it's unlikely it will. <laughs> Yeah. I hate no, to be a right. bummer. Yeah. I hate it. But um, what's true is if you you do your best to get around it. Yeah. But it doesn't have to limit you eventually. I mean, yeah. I'm not I am not I, I'm not an academic. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, but I I have had my own limited experience with having to fit. Mm -hmm. And I oh, hated it. I had, there was a woman who taught women's studies and begged me to participate in this, this academic project on women's ritual. And uh, I had never experienced anything like it before. And I had, you know, this peer review of what I wrote and all this thing. And I'm reading the comments and I, and this, and, and I have comments saying, well, I totally disagree with her idea of blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking I was there. Yeah, I, you don't, what are you saying to me? I was there. You weren't there. I don't know who you were, but you weren't there. And so, and I was, I was fighting this, you know, like, I, I just need to be out of this. Okay. I'm leaving. I'm not going to do it. And I was, and, and this was Wendy Griffin, uh, a blessed memory who was amazing teacher. And she, she wrote books on goddess. And anyway, she, she just said, I really, really, really need you to do this because this is the only way that you will be quoted allowed to be quoted yes by others because you're in this yes thing and i remember going ew i mean just like <laughs> okay okay i just had to take her take her at her word and i'm and i did and i did it and it was just really like horrible experience yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's definitely something that is a project to be worked on, I suppose, you know, for future future mm -hmm. women yeah. that are interested. Um, I was going to ask about yeah. witchcraft and mm -hmm. wickenry, if that's a word, because mm -hmm. and I was going to ask you actually two things. The first one was why Diana, not Artemis. Oh, yeah. And then about okay. the connection, yes. you know, with the Wiccans. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's it is Artemis. I Diane. I mean, the, the name giver of the tradition was based on Diana. Uh -huh. That is like an old thing. It comes from medieval times. There's variations on that. It honestly, the tradition is based on the nature of Artemis. Yeah. Diana is kind of like what I don't even think about Diana. I think it's about funny, right. It's funny. I know it's weird. It's I weird. Know. Me okay, too. so because the nature of and who she represents in terms of to at least in the way that I teach, I've taught about her as a as a role model for female liberation yeah. is because she we as women who've grown up in in the culture we live in, the discovery of who we would be 
without the conditioning, the thousands of years of, mm -hmm. of generational inheritance of female culturation, um, she gives us, in my view, a model for being one with nature, being yeah. nature herself, being fully able to be she is not tainted by she you know she lives on the outside she lives on the outskirts she is not she's not colonized yes oh right oh i love that yes right? she's yes. not colonized you know um and and because she's not colonized she doesn't have even a she represents in my, for me a way of visioning a possibility and we need them as women in the culture we live in because we applaud, you know, the heroines. We applaud women who, who live their lives authentically, you know, through whether it was political things or literature or art or you know all these ways. And Artemis, to me, really is, um, she's terrifying because yeah. because she she she's real. She is all of the the, the ways that nature. Um, expresses itself you know and here is this in, in this embodied female possibility so you know she was adopted by second wave feminism as a role model for female liberation and this this happened in the late in the 1970s and so even though it's diana it's not diana it's that's sort of like whatever right um but we couldn't we kind of inherited the word and we can't we you know we're not yeah. changing it now but that's it no there's nothing wrong with diana in that sense as a term but it's, it's kind of funny when i when when i was thinking <laughs> that, that every time somebody goes well do you know about diana and i'm like really yeah <laughs> um so or some people sometimes i'll get comments like well you know artemis was later diana i once had somebody that tried to convince me online of course that diana came before artemis you know uh, to which I was like, okay, stop answering comments, Carla. Yes. But, um, yes. but, but I thought that was kind of interesting. I like the word dianic or dianic. Yes. It fits like it mm -hmm. language wise, rhythm wise, it fits a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny that you say that about Artemis, because this is how I feel about her. And I, for a long time, I was afraid because I grew up in this sort of Catholic mm -hmm. obey bow. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, I was hesitant to call her like a collaborator with me or that she had a sister energy. Mm -hmm. I remember having sort of a, a vision, a, a meditation, we're part of a group vision journey where, you know, you go and you approach the goddess and she's there. And what's the first thing you do? And so the first thing I did was bow and her kind of reaching over to me and lifting me up and go, we don't, we don't bow here. Don't, right. That's no? right. Don't. That's and right. It was so powerful for me yes. because it was like, oh my gosh, you, you have the nerve, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to say that this is a collaborator and still honor the, it's, you know, honor her. Another word I might use is a partnership. Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. it's like we partner with her, Yeah. you know, and she shows us things and she lets us, you know, leads us places. Yes. You know, and, um, you know, yeah. and she's not, and she, and honestly, she's not warm and fuzzy. No, she no. is not warm and fuzzy. And so, and she is, she's, you know, one of the, um, the things that we talk about, uh, her as far as, you know, representing is she who is whole and to herself. Yes. She, she is that, you know, the original meaning of the word virgin, you know, non-possessed, you know, yes. unmarried, you know, all of that. And so she does from a cosmological space, she represents completion, yes. you know, and because we, we live in a culture that's so heavily based on duality. Mm -hmm. And of course, later paganism is all about duality. God is God, God is God, you know, yeah. all of that. Um, male, female, light day, you know, this whole, like, again, divide the world into these, these, yeah. these places she is to me the antithesis of that yes 
I agree. It's like she she's the web, you know, she is all of it. She's the creation, the preservation and the destruction. You yeah. know, she's she's the inhale, the sustaining breath and the exhale. <laughs> yes. Yes. And and she's unique in that. Like, you know, I mean, we do look at other goddesses. I love looking at different mm -hmm. goddesses and they have mm -hmm. their own unique qualities. But I have yet to find one that is quite mm -hmm the encompassing of all things in the way that she yes. is. So, yes. so this is my, my biggest pet peeve is about her is how underestimated she was in classics and in the, you know, and, and every time I kind of bump into her hunt, you know, her hunter, yeah. uh, 15 year old hunter sort of interpret. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'll give you some hunter, but you know, she's so much more. Um, so yes. this is the exciting time is that we get to really share her and others you know whoever other people specialize in mm -hmm. other divinities in their more like full in, you know embodied forms and their complexities yes yes that's the thing that was so, has been so great about your book is that the the comp you know how much more she is but it also makes me wonder how much more are all the rest of them I agree. Right. I had that with Hera. I had that with Hera <laughs> right. where I started doing what I don't even know why I started doing a podcast on her. Uh -huh. I can't remember. But anyway, yeah. so then you know you fall down the rabbit hole of research and the whole parthenogenesis and the whole yes. pre Greek yes. priestess. And yes. I thought, oh my yes. God. And why is right. no one working on Hera in the right. academy? I mean, yes. Why? Right. She's, right. she's well, incredible. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, if, if you begin to find out that, you know, and I, I, my own thoughts about this is why it's been so limited. I'm going to bring it back to Jung. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, and the thing about archetypes. Yeah. So when I started, I was think it was looking for the book on my shelf. I think it was, might've been the changing of the gods. It, yes. Um, I've read that. Okay. So wrote. one of the things, Judith, is it Judith Plaskow who did that one or who was, who was that? Well, it had to do with learning more about the man, um, in, Jung, because, yeah. uh -huh. um, what happened with the archetypal thing is that, um, you begin to kind of get, you, you want to box everybody into their little cubicles right because you know we you want to compartmentalize so that you can kind of pretend to understand the something you really freaking can't that's <laughs> right it, because it's so much bigger than you and your little brain so well, let's make let's diminish her let's make let's give her these things let's give give her these symbols only yes. oh yeah we there's a few over here but let's just pretend i didn't see that let's you know let's not look at the at the at the uh the spindle with the image of artemis okay let's not look at that what you know and um, because it doesn't fit all these things i already said yeah so let's not go there so the thing the thing i think that that contributed to the limitation of the deities i really you know on some level because Yes. And, and so, you know, I get into trouble with this in class, in a class, uh, my, like a, a first class that I series I do, because I talk about this and I, and what I try to express about when we have this conversation, who is the goddess, you know, we have like different topics and stuff. And I, of course, I'd never give an answer. I just want to, you know, it's not my, you know, but get them to try to think about this. What do you think about this? And, um, I, I tell women, I remind them that Jung was a man of his time, okay? Absolutely. And when I've read some of the stuff that he's written, like he was extremely racist. Yes. Extremely racist. And I think that again, you know, Freud did this too. Yes. Where things didn't that didn't fit his model that he was purporting got put out. Yes. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny that you say that because one of the things that's becoming really trendy is doing those quizzes of who is your goddess archetype. And I've always felt a mm -hmm. little 
like resistance to that. I mean, I've done them for fun. It's fun. Yeah. Every time the goddess comes up, I'm like, this is not my goddess. I don't know. Right. And then I think about how did we, you come up with the qualities of that goddess, which is typical patriarchal stories. Yeah. But now that I think of it more, there's a whole business burgeoning on this idea of archetypes, which is, is fine. You know, it's, yeah. we can sure. approach goddess from a variety of ways, but you're absolutely right when we talk about the fact that there's so much complexities around goddesses and perhaps the next phase of the work is starting to expand those. Maybe, maybe eventually we see that it's sort of a continuum. Yes. That is, you know, culturally represented differently because yes. of everyone's visions and interpretations. Yes. But that eventually it is source energy if we can use that language, right? Yes. It is, you know, you know, it's very fascinating that, that you say that because it's true. I see that. And I have always had a bit of weird things because archetypes have to, by, by very definition, be categorized. Yes, right? that's right. That's right. People will go, well, I'm working yes. with this archetype now. or I'm working with this archetype, which is fine as a language and a, a, well, a it, as a psychological idea to explore, of course. Yeah. Yes. At, yeah. But yeah. we have to recognize at the same time we are limiting the deity by doing it. Yes. It's yeah. like, if you can hold it, okay, I'm doing it because I have a freaking human brain yes. and my human brain needs to categorize. My yes. human brain needs to compartmentalize to understand yes. the, the whole, I have to start looking at pieces so I can understand this thing that is way bigger than I might, than my brain can manage. Yes. And but, you know, sorry, go ahead. I'm no, 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 it's okay. Go for it. What I was just thinking about Artemis is that one of the questions that comes up a lot to me is like, how can she be the goddess of childbirth if she doesn't have children? Right? right. Right. And I think that challenges the very archetype, right? So that the mother archetype automatically has to birth physically. Right. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Exactly. And, you know, so when I, I just finished a series on, um, uh, basically the uterine mysteries um and we were exploring the mother you know that the the mother concept and for so many women who uh nurture meaning teach like teachers you know teachers um uh who work with children who don't who don't have biological so they've never given birth but they are mentors mm -hmm. they're mentors they're caregivers they're aunt, they're protectors you know, am, the Amazon I, idea, which I think about is with Artemis, you know, she's the protector too. She's, you know, this is, I think because the mother image has been so put through the patriarchal whitewash, you know, yes. um, it is not seen as a strong character and it's limited. Yes. So, you know, if you, I think that, um, many women don't resonate with mother yes. because it has not been expanded to include them. Yes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think that that's a, another, another aspect we mm -hmm. need to work on, but I yes. think that's something that Artemis challenges by the very virtue and some of the inscriptions to her are mother, you know, and protect my child. And, yes. and so I have that question all the time uh, mm -hmm. from people. How is this possible? And, mm -hmm. and this, is the, this is the issue that you can yes. mother without birthing, let's say, another being. I think that um, if you look at the word mother, me plus other, mm. you yes. know, if you because if you think about the caregivers yes. and pro protectors, it's always relational to someone else or something, whether it's an animal, whether it's a, you know, a, you're in a garden, you know, your take, it's not just here. It's wherever you're needed to step in and take charge and make sure things, you know, happen the way they need to. And I think that um, so many of uh, so many women do this and don't give themselves credit. Yes, absolutely. You know? And I think it's a mother's, I think it's, this is for me again, I think it's a mother's job and, and mother is not exclusive to female birthing. Yes. Yes. Wow. I love this. This feels like we're, we're just, we're just talking for, for I know. Oh my goodness. 
Um, so oh, you wanted about you asked a question, started to ask yeah. a question about magic or, yeah. or spellcraft yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, so what is your question? <laughs> so I was just wondering what place that has or the Wiccan or witchcraft in the temple or maybe in your oh, house. Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, yes. So um, I love magic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love spellcraft. Um, and for me, um, teaching women how to to focus on their needs and how to generate energy toward that end wow. is what magic is really based on. And it's completely natural and it's completely just learning how to feel. Again, this is why our bodies are important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because um, magic doesn't happen without it. <laughs> and, um, right. and, and um, the fact that, but as, uh, going back to the mother's idea, yeah. it's linked for me because we do, whether you choose to physically give birth or, you know, uh, or choose not to, your body is still generating cr that creative energy. Mm -hmm. And so if it's like, I, there's an incredible resource that I have. I, I have it here somewhere. It was a book that I, when I got it in the seventies, it was already out of print and it was called um, women and music. And it was by a woman named Sophie drinker. And it was about ancient women. Um, like the first rituals that we know about was women singing, chanting, dancing, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. So we're talking about sound rhythm, that's right. Um, sound, rhythm, and movement. Yeah. And that is, so as, as female people who have that, that, who carry that energy within our bodies, we have wombs. Yes. Um, we have the ability then to bring about birth everywhere based right. on our working with sound, working with rhythm, working with movement with that's life if something is not moving sounding you know vibrating it's dead, dead. Right. it's dead right, right. Right. So, okay yes. Yes. so yes. it's um so i mean i don't i can't speak to too much how other people do magic or teach spellcraft i i really love folk magic that's where i come from about it it's the about ma about magic being communication and mm -hmm. that can happen again, uh, visual communication, sound communication, uh, you know, movement communication or. Right. Um, so it's just um, about teaching women how to access that. And, and a lot of it is actually just remembering. Wow. That's powerful. Yes. Yes. And I, I, I've, been feeling more and more called I can't put my word on, on my my finger on what mm -hmm. it is but it's this idea that I want women to experience what it was like in the ancient world and so part of that is remembering and I think that's my thing with Artemis is remember like yes. looking up as much as we yes. can find about her rituals yes. and then maybe trying to even reenact them at some point or use them in some way so that you're absolutely right so that we use our bodies and our voices yes. and Yes. Geographical spaces. And right. yeah, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of the practice is practice, right? right? It's like exactly. Practices, right. Well, and it's being reminded that we actually have it within us to do, yeah. you know, just like even the word remember, it yeah. means to re, you know, to re reconnect. Right. Yes. right? Yes. And, and even something, you know, like a meditation that I've certainly encourage women to do is once they begin to learn about artemis say um like go out where she lives and have her direct you know show you things walk with her you know i'm not talking about merging i'm talking about like joining like you're you, you know invite her as a friend invite yeah. her as a sister you know for, and to be able to step into her model of the world her model of the world is not going to be your model of the world. Right. And there is a terror in that, in being, in, in, in entering a different point of view. 
there is a terror in that because things sound different things you notice things visually that are you didn't wouldn't have noticed before you might feel physically different if you have her from let her show you from her point of view go on a walk wow i've never done that well you know That's check it out you know check it out because then it's like it's just it is a and that's magic also because you are more than you are yourself but you're more than yourself yeah you know and it's a way to access information that you certainly could access but we don't really often know how to do that yeah. so you know thinking about her you know and thinking about her and you know when she looks at a forest what does she see right if you look at the forest what do you see it's not going to be the same thing yeah. right yeah that's a very fascinating way of bringing sort of the goddess into your body or sharing sharing yes. that space yes that's yeah, right. I hadn't thought about that. I'm adding that to my list of things to do. Sure, absolutely. Please do. You know, th but this is how we can begin to know, I think, know her more, you know, because that is really coming into resonance with her, you know, as a part in a partnership way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I hope that we might do this again. Um, I would love to. Yeah. What, what are you doing? Sort of, are you doing any research coming up or anything that you have planned? As well, as book or a work or music? Or... Um, I am, you know, I'm always doing some music. Um, I'm always teaching classes. You know, I have a little bit of a summer break okay. um, on purpose. I'll, I'll start more with classes in the fall, but I've been, um, I still am helping to facilitate seasonal rituals or workshops that focus on the part of the Diana tradition also is the overlay of the female life cycle on the seasons of the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, this is something that I brought in from the work of Shakina Mountain Water, um, who was my teacher in the 1970s right um bring that that overlay so you know we're we're at summer solstice and we're this is the the fruiting time you know this is when life is tuned this is mother as yes. in food mother you know this is happening so um i'll be helping to facilitate an online summer solstice a few about a week after i get back from crete okay and then um in the then in the summer i'll be doing a few weeks later i'll be doing a workshop to prepare for the first harvest which would be um uh, most most folks understand it as llamas or mm -hmm. low mass you know that holiday okay. uh, we, we've kind of reworded it to um to the mother the the goddess of the land associated with that holiday is called uh, called tail i always pronounce it wrong uh tail to nasa Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, but, and then, you know, I'll be starting to teach full board in the fall again. And um, I'll do a couple of festivals this summer that are happening in Michigan and facilitating opening and closing ceremonies, some chant workshops, just more fun stuff for me. Yay. Okay. So uh, I'll ask you after too, to send me any links you might want, and okay. I will just add them to the bottom of our stuff. Okay. But that sounds like fun. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we'll we'll keep in touch, obviously. Yes. So yes. All right. So thank you so much for You're joining. So this was awesome. Don't go I hope away. everyone listening enjoyed it. I had fun. Yay! I hope so too. I hope so too. They're usually pretty good. good. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much and uh have a great afternoon. Thank you.